Hi kids. Um, you may have noticed that I haven't put forth as many of the videos as I would have liked. I think I'm missing four, five maybe. Oh my gosh, they did not come out very well. So I'm working on especially volume issues to make sure that you can hear me because I know that not even with my PowerPoint subtitles, the captioning, uh, I know that doesn't always um, record the proper word and um, it can be difficult, especially with names. So I'm trying to make sure that what I put up there for you is the best and sometimes that means nothing gets put up. So um, get ready for the rest of chapter 27 and I will start also working back to um, week four actually, with some Northern Renaissance, which hopefully will help uh, some of you doing some uh, term paper work, research work on uh, uh, the Reformation and other 16th century artists. So I want to make sure I get that up for you. Um, just uh, please be patient since uh, I'm not a... Um, I'm not a videographer, I'm not a recording artist. I'm used to just uh, telling you these things in person. So this is still, after a year in pandemic, uh, um, a work in progress. So uh, without further ado, let me actually switch over. Okay, the key to romanticism versus realism the two halves, really, of chapter 27, is that they are, in many ways, opposites, but these styles don't come one after the other. There are still romantic painters when realist painters are active, and vice versa, really. Although, as you can see, when we get into our kind of the nuts and bolts of the period, we're talking about a couple decades later. We're starting really in the mid 19th century for uh, realist artists who, in fact, use the name realist to even name themselves. So many of our examples go from you know the 1830s up to really the 1870s um, to end uh, chapter 27 for us. And while I say we're gonna focus on Western Europe and America, a lot of the work is French, I'm sure you've noticed, because that is still where the center of culture is. That's still central in terms of the academy. Uh, contextually, it's also central because France is this, as a republic since the fall of the monarchy, this grand experiment in revolution and democracy there are actually multiple revolutions in France. And by the 1850s, we have a country that's gone through a couple different monarchies, not just Louis the 16th, but Napoleon. And then there's another Napoleon with Republic in between. And add on top of that, uh, with the Industrial Revolution, changes in labor and new concerns for workers. This is also the era of Karl Marx and the dreaded socialism. The idea of not just workers' rights, but workers taking over and really owning and running the economy in many ways. That is just one of the radical politics uh, to emerge during uh, this century. The radical side, um, maybe that's uh, too judgmental a word to use, uh, comes from how, how different, how much of a change it is from the Europe and the America that these people knew just a few decades before. And it's difficult really maybe to square up how much of a continuation the 19th century is, from the Renaissance and the Enlightenment, the idea of trusting only what can be empirically observed, that is an idea that great scientists like Galileo and Sir Isaac Newton would champion. Those two date back to the 17th century, the Baroque period. 
So while we're dealing with a lot that is new, politically and technologically, we're also dealing with the continuation of this uh, yearning for knowledge, this sense of what it means to be enlightened, and in the art world, what it means to be classical, what it means to be good art. And our technology, not just photography that you're working on this week, but also the, the lithograph here, uh, by Daumier showing us a free day at the Salon is often accepted into the art world very tenuously as long as it fits into the hierarchy. Daumier's lithographs, for instance, appear in magazines, journals, newspapers. This is, in a way, kind of an editorial cartoon showing the crush of people. Uh, where, you know, everyone's allowed to come into the salon, so it's wall-to-wall -wall people, as you can see in the background, hopefully wall-to-wall -wall art as well. The rest of that French caption essentially <laughs> says, uh, each one an expert, each one a connoisseur. And on top of that, that cinq degrés de chaleur, it's hot. You can perhaps see the woman fanning herself. So we have women and children among the top-headed men of the academy. And the Salon, of course, is the annual show, the show, for any academic artist to try to get into. It's the place where these realistic scenes of everyday life, like Libel's Three Women in a Village Church, are not accepted laborers, current events, these things aren't, according to the Academy, heroic, and they're certainly not mythological. So they don't fit the classical academic theme of what art, good art, that is, should be. Formally, because we're looking at everyday people, like the old women here, as well as the young women, these figures can be un- idealized and yet monumental in their rendering. Even when the painting is small, the figures fill up the canvas. The opposite would be how tiny figures appear in a romantic landscape, for instance. Along with that change in scale and proportion comes this flatness and pattern. One of my favorite parts about Leibel, and uh, the reason I'm sad not to include him, uh, in your uh, uh, slide list is the border here. Maybe you can see it. Oh. Sorry, a little crooked here. And th there are times where the border of his kind of rougher paint merges with the more refined, uh, finished paint of the canvas. We're essentially looking at an unframed version here, an unframed photograph. So we can see just how reliant on pattern and almost a collage of forms and figures Leibel has con um, you know, constructed his composition with. So these are the men who uh, make those decisions about what is good and what is not. These top-headed men uh, in Daumier's aspect, uh, pardon me, aspect of uh, the Salon on opening day. Academic style in this sense is not only going to be divided between Poussinist and Rubenist, if you remember those two terms, but also it's going to be dependent upon what the artist has chosen. There's a hierarchy of types of painting, genres, remember? The history painting is the top. To win the prize of the Salon, it's going to be a history painting. On down the line, we have genre scenes, everyday life, portraits, and not even making it to that hierarchy will be lithography here because lithograph is for a completely different set of the world. That's for the newspapers and the oil paintings are the ones that belong in the salon. Sculpture too, 
but as you can see, the gallery is quite crowded, so we don't quite have a view of the sculpture in the salon just yet. But here's a kind of a, a digital, virtual view of what that might mean. Uh, another snippet of Domie here. You can see, again, a crush of people in the 1850s and the classical female nude, probably Aphrodite's and Venus's on the wall. More Aphrodite's and Venus's and David's in marble and bronze on pedestals in the center. So really, all you have to do is look back to our past slide lists and imagine them in these great gold frames piled up on the walls, one on top of the other, to get a sense of what the salon will be like. So take a look here at, on the right, we of course have Nicolas Poussin's Et in Arcadia Ego. Upper left, uh, Titian's Venus of Urbino, and down there, lower left, uh, Velasquez's uh, pardon me, the water cellar. Which one do you think would win the prize? Well, which one's a history painting? Remember, a history painting is going to be of a heroic subject, classical in nature, rationally composed. So Etna Arcadia Ego is what really settles that genre. We go from that to our reclining female nude, maybe not necessarily at the top of the hierarchy, but still a mainstay in the academy, not just as Aphrodite's and Venus's, but as that ideal of beauty. And we might even classify Velasquez's water cellar as a Jean Racine, even though we can interpret a little bit into it as, a, as to a more artistic or poetic metaphor among the three figures, right? That's the crush of art on the walls amid the crush of people. Where we have, remember, from decade to decade, these shifts of painterly and Rubeniste to Poussin and linear and rational form. On the left, of course, is Rubens and his consequences of war. This Poussin I'm showing you is not one you've seen before. This is the uh, abduction of the Sabine women, a story, a scene from the legendary founding of Rome. So both of these subject-wise fit the bill for history painting. It just becomes a matter of who is fashionable, who is in charge at the time. And in the 1850s, it really was a Poussiniste type of academy. So you can imagine, you would see great history paintings like this, and on the pedestals you would see sculptures akin to uh, Giovanni da Bologna's Abduction of the Sabine Women, two very similar uh, subjects here, both Roman, both ancient and classical. One, of course, Baroque on the left, Renaissance Mannerist on the right, but accepted by the Academy of the 19th century as the classical, as the epitome of good art. So we'll see to what degree the artists in chapter 27 stick to the Poussiniste or branch off on their own into the realm of realism. In portraiture, remember, we have especially in England, a sort of a, a, an in-between genre of the grand manor portraiture where the person is as much of a big deal, the sitter is as much of a big deal as the painting itself. So you could also have in your salon uh, these wonderful, rather large images of great people, lords and ladies amid uh, these great sculptures, like Bernini's David on the left, and again, Abduction of the Sabine Women on the right. So the Salon is already, by this time, this odd mix of very prim and proper 18th century noble nobility, but also Baroque drama and mannerist nudity and excess and artifice 
So I, when I talk about academic style, remember, as clear-cut as the academy wants it to seem to be, academic style really is just the sum of everything from the Renaissance up to the present day that fits the bill, Poussinist or Rubenist. And then comes Gustave Colbert. Corbet, excuse me. We have a heroic scaled painting, and that's as close as it gets to history painting. The color, the execution of his brushwork are called brutal and coarse. The subject matter, the stonebreakers, is mundane, trivial. Before large machinery, to make roads and to pave roads, men had to physically swing their hammers and break up the stones. So this is political. Corbet is, in a way, showing a sympathy to laborers that the great top-hatted men of the academy maybe didn't want to see, are not used to seeing, and perhaps just didn't realize existed anyway, because they're the ones flying by in their coaches, probably with the windows closed. It's radical, not just in its subject, but in its formal visual characteristics. To be realist is to be radical. As much as we might think of the word real and think, well, that's what art is meant to be, right? Oh, 1849, real was brutal, coarse, mundane, trivial, political, radical. Compared to our great history painting, look at the change in color palette. Jewel tones and golds and rosy cheeks to a palette limited to brown, black, gray. Still, Corbet isn't giving us something completely boring. There's wonderful pops of contrast with the white the striped pattern of the older man's vest, and particularly details like the sewn and repatched and darned pants and holy ripped shirts that they're wearing, the inadequate shoes that show not just the class and economic status of these stonebreakers, but it gives you a great sense of what life is like what it would be like. This is not just manual labor. This is back-breaking, heart-breaking labor that we have in front of us here. Not only that, on the left-hand side, is that a full-grown man or a boy? This is decades before any child labor laws. You might also, like Velasquez, read it in terms of metaphor, as in the young man becomes the old man, stuck in this perpetual life of labor. And don't we have these conversations today economically? How different is Corbet's criticism of his world in 1849 France versus our own criticisms of our world during the pandemic with, you know, will we get a stimulus check? Will we be able to pay our rent? I've just lost my job. Will I find a new one? Same tune, different time, huh? And that is, to the Academy, something that doesn't belong in art. To this day, you could probably find people who think politics currently don't belong in art. So here's what Corbet thought did not belong in art. He's famous for saying, show me an angel and I'll paint one. And on the right, I have an example of, of biblical angels, the seraphim from Isaiah 6-2. Above it stood the seraphims. Each one had six wings with twain. That means two, he covered his face. With two, he covered his feet. And with two, he did fly. Moving on to the medieval world, Dante describes them in his famous uh, Paradiso, 
The number of these angels is so great that there has never been a mortal speech or a mortal thought that named a sum so, so steep. And if you look at that which is revealed by Daniel, you will see that while he mentions thousands, he gives no number with precision. The first light reaches them in ways as many as are the, are the angels to which it conjoins itself, as it illumines all of them. Essentially, Dante is describing the heavenly host here as this uncountable, innumerable, uh, illuminated crowd of angels that I'm, here I'm showing you depicted by William Blake. So our romantic artists would have no issue, perhaps, with displaying, depicting something that requires imagination, faith. But this is not based on empirical observations. So in terms of what art ought to be, with romantics, there seems to be no limit. But with realists, it must be what's in front of you, what's in front of your eyes. And in front of these men's eyes, in the mid-19th century, we have, again, just a really dire, dark, dismal look at what it is to be the have-nots when the academy is run by the haves. Jean-Francois Millet has his gleaners, as Corbet has his stonebreakers, to kind of insert this concern for laborers, concern for the workers into the realm of history painting. And again, while neither painting is uh, monumental in its actual size, you know, these aren't 10 feet tall, for example, the monumentality comes from how the figures, these women who go through and pick the leftover kernels of wheat or barley, that have just been harvested, that's what gleaning means. They are painted at the same proportion, at the same scale as Aphrodite, as any great hero like Hercules that you might see in the history paintings down the hall. And that is what is so striking visually and politically for the Academy. These are everyday people. These shouldn't be given a place in art. Although there is already precedence for art to use a kind of a morality in its subject matter, like Angelica Kaufman's uh, example of Cornelia showing off her children as her treasures. It was a perfect, ideal example of motherhood in Roman terms, as the neoclassicist would have it. Compare here to the gleaners, and you can see what I'm talking about with the monumental scale. The gleaners fill the canvas the way that Cornelia and her sons, the Gracchi, who will famously defend Rome as they are grown up, they're, they're occupying the same place on the wall with the same treatment. Arguably, we could say, though, Mie takes some... Rubenist, or a painterly time in depicting the barrenness of the field with these flecks of uh, gold, especially along the bottom. And behind them, the legitimate harvest that the men have just completed, the farm in the background, the, the horizon, the sky, all of that fades in atmospheric perspective, leaving us with these women just pushed right up into our faces, right up to the picture plane. Not as some great Roman ideal, but a new contemporary French ideal. And that's what many people in the academy have to struggle to accept. Because many of the people in the academy are the ones who own the farms, who own the factories. These are the bourgeoisie. 
And if you've ever used the term bougie, that's where that comes from. Bourgeoisie is the upper class of France, particularly, who own property, they employ people, and therefore may not be quite so down to earth, may not be quite so uh, attuned to the struggles of the working poor, or as Karl Marx would call it, the proletariat. So a little practice here. Rosa Bonheur, a really a, a wonderful example of a female artist, again, working in a male-dominated world, and her horse fair. Academic or no? Is she accepted to the salon? Or is she an outsider like Corbet and Millet? What do you think? We have everyday people, the grooms and riders of the horses. A horse fair, unlike a race, um, is also a place where you can buy horses. And perhaps that's the key. This is uh, also an event that the bourgeoisie would show up to. They're not going to show up to watch the gleaners. They're certainly not going to pay attention to the stone breakers. But they will come to the horse fair to buy some new horses. So this is a, an acceptable meeting of the two classes. Rabonor would definitely have a spot. So she is kind of put here in very classical, heroic ways. Not the men, but the horses as the main character. And I especially love her format. See how wide and horizontal this is? She does this in multiple canvases. So it's like a panoramic photo. You follow it back and forth, left and right. She's still following Poussin and David's classical rules. It's contained within the painting. There's no um, overly fantastic imagination, and there's no Baroque swoop of uh, motion that's going outside the canvas. Everything is contained in this set moment of action as the horses round this bend for potential buyers to see them. Compare it back to the gleaners. One accepted into the academy, another not accepted by the academy. And it comes down to context because the brushiness used by Millet is also used by Bonheur. You can see it especially in the ground and the trees, but also the muscle of each horse. Look at that wonderful rendering of their hair, hooves, and especially musculature and tendons. She's showing off exactly what someone looking to buy a horse would want to look at. And the men in top hats, the bourgeoisie, recognize this. They don't recognize this heroic scaled depiction of gleaners. These are the people who are ignored. And if you're going to show a country scene, why not, like John Constable, show us something more picturesque? This is the type of farmer, the type of worker that the Academy wants to see. And Constable's work here in the 1850s, remember, is escapism. It's to deflect from the struggle between farmer and landowner and new industry like the railroad. So it's to deflect from the current political and economic situation. So does art have to be escapism or can art put reality right up in your face? That seems to be the question for these realists. To answer that in another way, we have to go to England for the Pre-Raphaelite Brotherhood. Now these English painters, they have a different take on what art could or should be. 
again, they can be divided up into Rubenist and Poussinist. We might even say John Everett Millet is rather Rubenist with his very brushy work in the water there with Ophelia. It's the subject matter that really separates the Pre-Raphaelites, though. So in England, they are interested in their own medieval history, as well as the early Renaissance, and fictional sources, literary sources like Shakespeare. Ophelia, if you're not aware, is a main character in Shakespeare's play, The Tragedy, Hamlet, which I'm going to read a little bit from you, uh, from uh, uh, Hamlet for you. Everything about this is academically proper. It's illusionistic in style. You can see depth and foreshortening. We have this bright color palette. And the Pre-Raphaelites seem to agree with the bourgeoisie. They dislike the ugliness of present day. The railroad is ugly. Factories are ugly. The smoke coming out of their chimneys, ugh, ugly. What is beautiful is the spirituality of the medieval period, the idealism of the Renaissance. That's what they want to get back to. But even so, there's pushback on the Pre-Raphaelites as well. Because again, Ophelia is from Shakespeare. She's not Aphrodite from classical mythology. She's not some great historical queen. So still the Pre-Raphaelites are challenging what it is to be a history painting, challenging what it is to be good classical painting. See how it's, we can't really divide it into two factions. There's multiple opinions at work here. So let's get into Aphrodite, um, excuse me, Ophelia herself. Spoken by Queen Gertrude of Denmark here. There is a willow grows a slant of brook that shows his hoar leaves in a glassy stream. There with fantastic garlands did she come of crow flowers, nettles, daisies, and long purples that liberal shepherds give a grosser name. But our cold maids do dead men's fingers call them. There on the pendant boughs, her coronet weeds, clamoring to hang, an envious sliver broke. When down her weedy trophies and herself fell in the weeping brook, her clothes spread wide and mermaid-like, a while they bore her up, which time she chanted snatches of old tunes as one incapable of her own distress, or like a creature native and endued unto that element. But long it could not be, till that her garments, heavy with their drink, pulled the poor wretch from her melodious lay to muddy death. Muddy death, that should say. This is the moment in the play where Ophelia, who has been driven mad, has fallen to her death. And depending on how you interpret it, allowed herself to sink, or because of her mental state, wasn't aware of the danger. Famously, Millet used the wife of a friend as his model, lying in a bathtub. And I actually just saw a movie featuring John Everett Millet and John Ruskin uh, and this painting, which is on Netflix, if you're curious, uh, called Effie Gray. So again, Millet is looking at what's right in front of him. His friend, also the play itself, the source material. And in that way, we could call it realist with a big R. But it is also not quite so real in the in the sense that it's fiction, right? But isn't all art fiction? Don't we want a moment of tragedy, a moment of sadness? 
We want to be able to turn the page, though. We want to be able to look away. We don't want the sadness to be our only experience of art. Still, there's beauty in it, not just Ophelia herself, the flowers that float on the water, but the lovely uh, buoyant look we get here, especially as we can see, oops, not quite, where her body is up above the water and translucently down below. And that comes from a study of real life. And his knowledge of, of drama, of the, the biggest uh, pathos or emotional tug possible. So is it heroic? The, the Academy says no. Is it beautiful? To the extent that the Academy would call this overly sentimental. So which is it? Should art make you feel? Or can art make you feel too much? Even in lithograph, Honoré Daumier, with his Rue Transmoment, shows another tragic death, this of a poor family in a tenement, an apartment building that the French police storm into at night, indiscriminately killing because someone, reportedly from that building, attacked them. So this is why I had a content warning, right? Domia is showing us the plight of the urban poor in the quiet aftermath of a very bloody massacre, murder, at the hands of the authorities, the state. We don't even get to see this in our news today. We look at the images of Breonna Taylor, for instance, George Floyd, all the way back to Tamir Rice, here in Cleveland itself, provided by their families. Daumier gives us, gives the French public, through the newspaper, a look as if they are the detectives, they are the ones, they are the first responders to witness. And that's where lithograph is very different from other prints, like etching, or engraving. Because lithograph involves drawing directly on stone with an oily crayon, you can see brush strokes, if you will. We can see Domi's hand across the page. Even though, as all print is, it's mass produced. So he could draw this one image very expressively with this contrast of light, almost like Caravaggio's tenebrism, spotlighting particularly the, the father figure and do you see the child? The point is not, did Domier actually see people in these positions? Or at least, I want you to put that aside for a moment. Domier created this image. We don't know. Can we trust that is objective witness? Or is there a little more of Daumier in this? Positioning, creating drama, creating pathos, the way that Millet just did for us with Ophelia. In black ink, of course, the dark shadows on the floor that would in reality be red are muted, but what is much more stark, I think, is the slide of the father down with the child off the bed. And when we go beyond that main focus, and we'll use Goya's 3rd of May 1808 as well, we have the main axis and the other opposing axis of mother or wife, 
making an X across. We've seen that from Jericho. Sodomiate, most likely, is aware of the wrath of Medusa and aware of just how successful that is at creating an emotional response. Goya chose a much simpler left versus right. On the left, we have the Spanish. On the right, we have the French. Similar in subject matter, massacre at the hands of French police in both painting and lithograph here. Different in, of course, palette. Different in composition, X versus bilateral symmetry. But not much is different. We call one artist a romantic, Goya, another artist a realist. See, are they opposites? Mm. What is different is Goya is showing us the whole thing. He's showing us the prisoners being marched up, the firing squad lining up, and the victims on the ground. Daumier has chosen just this moment to depict for us in lithograph. It's quieter, there are no gunshots, there's no action, there's no perceived speech. And I think it's the silence, not only of the moment he chose, but of the ink only, that helps with the pathos of his argument, you could say. Along with an article about the event, this drove the public mad. Driving them mad in another way is Edouard Manet with his Le Déjeuner Solaire, Luncheon on the Grass, 1863. So we're getting a little later here. My oh my, what could possibly be wrong with this one? Remember what I've said about nude figures? If you see a nude lady, for instance, right there front and center, she's not necessarily there. She's not necessarily just a nude woman. She could be a personification. She is a telltale sign that the artist wants us to puzzle something out. But Manet is a trickster. So let's look. We have a picnic on the lower left, and look, there are her clothes. Oh dear. It's looking less and less like she's just a personification. Typically, with this type of scene, we should have a sense of maybe she's amused, right? These are two men who are inspired by her. She's not really there. She's a a personification of their conversation. But those clothes, they take away that option. Let's also look at what's going on in the background. Zoom in on that. Not only do we have a second woman who inexplicably bathing and completely ignored by the main party, is, if you look at that sense of distance, doesn't she seem a little too big Look at the boat on the right-hand side, right above this gentleman's head here. First, back to her. If the perspective of the landscape is true, is right, she ought to be a little smaller in scale. This is what Mane does. He takes foreground, middle ground, and background and squeezes them together right in our faces. What is he trying to do with that? There's no personification. There's no metaphor, no moral. He is making us actually deal with illusionism itself. Oh, you're used to seeing naked women, right? Well, what about this one? She's not Aphrodite. She doesn't serve some metaphorical purpose. You're used to seeing her painting size picture windows, right? Well, here, here's a reminder that this is just
black canvas to the point that I'm going to put paint on it as messily as possible in some places to remind you of this. So while he, Manet makes us think about the nude women on the wall of the salon, he makes us think about this grand classical academic tradition that has cropped up since the Renaissance and how silly it can seem. On the right hand side in the salon, we still have people like Bougereau painting fawns and satyrs frolicking with nymphs. One is perfectly acceptable, the other one lewd. Speaking of lewd, did you read what the critics said about this one, Olympia? Who has a lot to unpack with this one? Manet painted, probably possibly from life, a well-known courtesan. Her job is to be a companion, a sexual partner to the great men of Paris. So I wouldn't call it a prostitute or a lady of the night. She's a professional though. She goes to places where the wives cannot go. And she is taken care of. She is paid well. The gentleman sent her flowers as you see her maid coming in from the right brings her. On the far right, can you see the cat arching up? A black cat nonetheless. Oh, that brings up the Renaissance, witchcraft. There's all sorts of taboo things in this painting. So what do the men in top hats think? Some of them probably engaged Olympia at some point. This isn't what we're meant to see in the Academy, right? This is for private things. They dislike how Manet has painted her, not just staring out at us as his nicest object to be gawked at, she is looking at us, but she is in very stark, almost outlined, crisp paint with very exaggerated, very stark shadows of chiaroscuro here on her hands and feet. Oh, they made fun of her hands and feet, calling them dirty. They did not like the inclusion of the maid, but you guessed it, her race. Inappropriate to put this up there. Art is meant to be beautiful. But come on, what's not beautiful about this? It's real, it's true. There were women who worked as Olympia works. There were maids, there were black women operating in French society. They often didn't make it to the Salon Wall though. Because that is what you see in the real world. And you don't want the real world, right? So here she is taking back some agency, we could say. She is an active figure. Not even, she's ignoring her maid, looking out at us. What does that make us, the viewer? We're one of the men. It's almost accusatory. Keep on going and let me show you this view. We have some hyper realistic, and because he's collapsed the pictorial space right up in front of us, in our faces, it's a reclining female nude, but nowhere near the acceptability, the appropriateness of Grand Elise. And right there, we should begin to question well, why is that one appropriate and this one isn't? because race is hidden, literally whitewashed in the anger 
Oh, do these? It's supposed to be a Turkish slave girl, remember? You have a sense of a an object of sexual desire, but in the right context. The one who's been othered. So in a way, Mana is directly engaging with the history of art. You could say directly engaging with Grand Odalisque itself. He takes this Turkish slave girl here and separates her out, pulls these aspects of her out. And, oh, together you like this combination. But when I show you this woman as a sexual object, and this woman of another race, exotic race. Now you don't like either of them. Mm -hmm. Let's pick up a free Venus over Beano there, and we can see a chain of declining female mood, classical mythology, to French exoticism, to Manet's in-your-face realism where we can get into a very in-depth feminist and uh, uh, race uh, criticism of the painting. I wouldn't necessarily say that Manet was some great champion of women and particularly black women. His pony in the race is one of pointing out the hypocrisy of past artists and the academy itself. You could say that whether romantic or realist, the great power of art is big, huge ideas fit into rather small spaces. Winslow Homer is for many people the great artist of the Civil War, the American Civil War, that is. So his veteran in a new field, you can imagine, has many different layers. And it all depends upon how long we look at it and how long we think about those words, veteran in a new field. So let's take the title first. We have someone who's fought in the war. This isn't really the man we're looking at, right? Any proof of that? No. This is our main focus. And he's isolated on the canvas against this stark row of, of wheat, we could presume, or barley. But down here, that is a union uniform and canteen. As if he's gone directly from battlefield to farm field. Veteran in a new field. A new role. A new life. He's in the middle of harvesting. And here, I think, does the book still talk about the type of scythe? Are they going about how it's an older type of scythe? By now, in 1865, there's a compound scythe, like this one. Does anyone else see these bars over here? Almost as if Homer made that change later. But he didn't really cover it up, and with oil paint, he was perfectly capable of doing so. It's almost as if it's a ghost of modern technology. But what we get from um, looking at, let me show you one more time, looking at it as a single blade scythe, is there a metaphorical character, a personification in Halloween that carries a scythe? The Grim Reaper? And what does the Grim Reaper symbolize? What does he do? Death. So this veteran who presumably, as a veteran, has escaped death on the battlefield is now reaping, harvesting, mowing down crops. 
But he still needs to calm Mom down. Sometimes for maybe the most callous way of talking about gun violence. Rather stark, isn't it? So then the, the idea becomes what well, is Mom idealizing the violence? Or is Homer in some kind of clairvoyant way showing the struggle yet to come in Reconstruction? Not just for the veterans, but for the newly freed people in the South, for the former Confederates, for the country itself. If we're going to heroically paint a soldier, a veteran, we don't put his back to us, right? He's in uniform, he's not off to the side, and he's not performing farm labor. So Homer is showing us something very, um, radical. Realist, but radical, on, the, on par with Nye's Gleaners. You can see almost in terms of proportion and horizon line, he's using the same toolkit as the French painter of about a decade earlier. Other American realists like Eakins shows us the Gross Clinic, so named not because it's gross, but that is the name of the American doctor that you see right here, front and center, surrounded by his students, his aides, his staff, and his patient. But the realism of blood, not only on the patient, but on Dr. Gross's fingers and scalpel hold and held in his right hand, the anguish of the uh, relative who realistically would not have been in the gallery at the time. And this type of surgery would have been performed in a gallery for arts, uh, not art, uh, medical students to watch. There's things about this then that are realistic and things that are maybe a little more imagined to dial up the impact. So why might the salon reject it as brutal and coarse, the way they rejected Corbet. Hmm? Not only is this showing us just enough to get a sense of what they're doing, holding open the incision, all you medical or future medical students here. They're also showing the use of ether to keep the patient asleep. Can you tell what body part that is? These are socked feet. They're working on the thigh. Here's the hip. That's as close as we get to a sense of recognizing a human form here. It's almost inhuman. It's almost dehumanizing the actual patient. The focus is the composition of doctors and medical students in the background with this stark light used artistically, but there really would have been a stark spotlight for Dr. Gross to see what he's doing. So Renaissance to realism. Compositionally, subject-wise, let's look at what Eakins is doing compared to the grand history beloved by the Academy. On the left is Mantegna's Foreshortened Christ. You might remember that from way, way, way back in week two, where the up-in-your-face-ness of Mantegna's work is meant to evoke sympathy, grief over the crucifixion of Jesus. He distorts the foreshortening of the feet especially, so that we can see all the wounds, so that we can see the face of Jesus himself. Mm -hmm. 
Deacons distorts or hides perhaps the human body on the table there because it's not so much about who is on the table, but the whole gathering. So we could say in terms of focal point, and here I'm even only showing you part of Eakins, the body is the focal point, the form on the left. On the right, it's not the form, but the action, the drama, the newness of operating with ether under anesthesia. Versus Rembrandt, pushing along to the future, almost you know, left to right, similar to subject matter here, the anatomy lesson of Dr. Tulp, where we have a very Baroque uh, diagonal, where instead of being uh, perpendicular to us, the cadaver, the body, is oblique, and we have this lovely swoop in Baroque fashion of people lined up. This is essentially a portrait of Dr. Tulp and his students. Notice how some of them are staring out at us and not really paying attention to the lesson. No one's staring out at us in Dr. Eakin's Gross Clinic. No, excuse me, Mr. Eakin's Gross Clinic. On top of that, look at how much more realistic the actual procedure seems. More believable. Because by that time, 1875, people were also looking at photographs of operations under ether. So Eakins had a very big uncanny valley to, to hurdle across. He couldn't paint like Rembrandt. That'd be too idealistic. So this is in the moment. This is not the doctor posing. This is not the medical students getting ready to show off the best part. A few of my ESPN lines here. Honor to the Enlightenment, champions of observation and empiricism, and Rite of Darby's work, again, seems posed. It is meant to show a cross-section of the population who is interested in the planets, who is interested in uh, the professor's lecture, it is idealizing the act of learning. So the lack of idealism, the lack of refinement, the lack of pose, this is not portraiture. It's not even really genre scene either. It's history painting when the history is medical. So when it comes down to it, there's just this very strange rubric the Academy uses for what is acceptable and what is not, where they don't like Egan's that's too in your face, too truthful. But they love John Singer Sargent. In fact, Singer Sargent works in Europe amid uh, all of the rich people of England and France, like the daughters of Edward Darley Boyd. So where he's using the same flat, brushy style as Eakins, as Manet, as Homer, yet he's got the right clients, he's got the right patrons. Look at how brushy this is. Isn't that wonderful? This is, there's no sense of uh, Jan van Eyck or Renaissance illusion in that every single texture looks like wool and silk and wood. Everything here is obviously paint, but it's still realistic in that we see a precocious little girl posing, or maybe not posing quite the way the way she is supposed to, with a doll whose dress is just so brushily prepared, it's barely there on the canvas. So it depends on who you know. Well, here, Velasquez versus Singer Sergeant. Now, from the right hand side, sees the one that is modern and radical 
it's grouping. We don't have any play of mirror. We don't have a play of artist putting himself in there in self-portrait form. You could say that that Seymour Sargent has departed from the Renaissance just as much as any other realist. Yet he's still focusing on things that are beautiful, ideal, picturesque. Families, riches, refinement. The experiences of other artists, particularly in America, like Edmonia Lewis, and if you don't know her, look her up. She's either born in here in Northeast Ohio or in New York, went to Oberlin and experienced terrible prejudice there, but worked her way to Rome itself, to Italy where she could study Michelangelo's work, the master. So here, even though Forever Free is tabletop size, nowhere near as tall as David on the left there, it is, in 1867, essentially a commemoration of the Emancipation Proclamation in 1863 and the end of the Civil War in 1865, when many, particularly uh, in the further reaches of the Confederacy in Texas, finally got the news about the proclamation and the amendment. So Forever Free shows us people in shackles and manacles that are broken apart. And they are raising, there he is, raising his arm and almost in, in triumph, the woman clasping her hands either in prayer or in thanks. And the book really gets into gender relationships here, which I don't really, uh, you can, it's completely valid. For us, I wanna focus though on Lewis's experience. She is, an artist who is, has got three strikes against her, right? Female, black, and Native American. All three of those things together, that's what makes it so amazing that she works her way to Rome selling small-scale sculptures called medallions. Almost like uh, souvenirs and commemorative plates for people. And she has uh, one particular sculpture in the Cleveland Museum of Art, uh, the uh, Indian Battle, that really put the current situation in America, in 1867 that is, into heroic classical marble. So even though it's not large scaled like David, we recognize it, we see it for what it is. She's giving her people, her community, and her time the same heroic treatment that David and George Washington, and now African Americans, Black Americans get. So think about these, whether it's Europe or America, what is meant by academic art? Remember, they are quite hypocritical sometimes in what art ought to be. Classical, heroic, mythological, Poussinist, Rubenist. So how did the works of these realists factor into French academic standards? Some accepted, some not. And those pre who seem to be quite academic, and yet there's something very romantic, that there's a departure there too, from the academic. And finally, why does the American Academy copy the European Academy? What might be appealing about the traditional American style? What might be appealing about realism on the other side of the Atlantic Ocean? 